is going to be oh, – hey, my goodness, happy Monday, everybody. Manufacturing Monday Motivation is here. Best day of the week. Damon, yep. how are you, brother? What's happening, man? I'm doing great. We had a 48-hour hiatus from internet or cable access, access at our house this weekend, man. which was really interesting. So – you know, the, the only thing that I got to say that was good, it was it was good being off the grid a little bit, but we still figured out how to broadcast that Seahawks game in here well, to see the win. Hey, God bless you. And how about this little victory here for my dear friend Whitney Boom. from Houston, right? How about those Astros? And, yes, Whitney, we have the best beard in manufacturing yep. here. So let's – you know what? And the thing is, Damon, so I have a bunch of dudes on stage that are big. You know, everybody here is from Buffalo area. I thought we'd be having like everybody being in a really good mood today, but that didn't happen. But we'll forget about football for a minute. So we'll celebrate your victory mm -hmm. and then we'll just skip on and we won't talk football anymore. Right, Max? Right, Dave? All right. Yes. We'll just kind of skip over that. So, anyway, happy Monday. It is such a glorious, amazing, it's a beautiful day here. And what a great way to kick off November. And we want to talk about great stuff here with my dear friend, Max Krug. Max, how are you, brother? Great. How are you doing? I'm doing for having awesome. us on the show today. Oh my God, dude, this is so long overdue. And so, Max, we go way back. We have some funny stories to, to share. Uh, we're super tight. Families are tight. We've got Dave Griffith in the house here. Dave, how are you, dude? I'm doing great, Kurt. I am mostly fully caffeinated, but we've got round two or round three coming up as well. All right. So, I know. <laughs> Max, what are you drinking? I'm hitting water. Were you anything strong? Cranberry in your juice. You got cranberry <laughs> All right, I just I punished my Ooh. orange juice and now I moved on to water. So, all right, let's dig into the show. We've got uh, Diane here today, guys. Man, this is going to be a good one. If you are out there, drop us a note. Let us know. Uh, give us a hello. You absolutely want to connect with Max. Max is just a dynamo. He's a guru. He is the founder, CEO of Future State Engineering. We've got Dave Griffith here, and Dave is a digital nomad. He's a fierce podcaster. We're going to be talking about your podcast, Dave, and you guys are efficiency experts. So, Max, I want to I want to kick things off with you, dude. I know you're a big ski guy. I grew up here in Western New York, where we're, yep. we're located right outside of Buffalo. And so, you know, I know you're a big athlete guy, and you know, uh, our daughters are figure skaters together. Just so for everybody out there, so Max and I. Our second home is at the skating rink. We're together constantly. I'm with Max's wife all the time. We just live at the skating rink. Max, as a young man growing up near outside of Buffalo here, who was your hero growing up? Who was your hero growing up that sparked this incredible guy that you are? Yeah, so probably my father. Nice. <laughs> so he was a great influence on me. Um, he was a great athlete growing up and taught me a lot about sports competitiveness even though i'm an introvert it's like hard for me to be like super competitive but <laughs> and 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 of course through all of our figure skating shows i've met mom numerous times what's dad's name my dad's name yep don don so all right so don is your hero thank you for sharing that and i know we have a christmas skating show coming up in a few weeks so i'll probably get to see mom dave same question at your brother you are a digital nomad. We're mm -hmm. going to dig into that. Dude, you like you and your wife, Beth, and your your Archie, that wonderful yeah. Archie. You guys travel the country, grew up in Buffalo. Share yep. with us, who was your hero growing up? That's a good question, Kurt. I, I think both of my grandmothers, right? So my grandma on my mom's side and my grandma on my, my dad's side, I think both of them were just amazing people and kind of did things in, in ways that no one was doing uh, back, you know, 50 years ago uh, plus. Um, my, my nan... My dad's mom, she, she ran a country store, and I have nice. some of my, my greatest young memories growing up in, in, in eastern Maryland. I'd go and spend the week, and it was this old house from, from the mid-1800s, and she would just kind of, the prototypical southern lady, right? So, so Nan would go, and the store would open when Nan wanted the store to open. The store would close when Nan was done working in the store uh, at, at the end of the day. And so I have some amazing, uh, amazing memories there, and then my, my mom's mom, uh, also an amazing, amazing woman. She ran a credit union in North Tonawanda up here for a number of years, started that um, and uh, kind of continued and finished her career as mayor and kind of just, I don't know, she just, I, my memory growing up is she just kind of did whatever she wanted to do and, and no one was foolish enough to tell either of them no. 
Well, dude, the app, the Apple, did, did you say mayor? Did I hear? Did you say yeah. mayor? She mm -hmm. was the mayor of North Tonawanda? Yep. Okay. So oh. all right, North Tonawanda is a great suburb of Buffalo. Man, it, it was a rival of ours in football. And so, you know, she was the mayor. And so that is absolutely fantastic. And dude, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, does it? Because no. man, I know you, you march at your own, you know, your own beat and just do an amazing job. So, all right, guys, let's dig into your superpowers. You are fierce advocates for U.S. manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Dave, you know, you and I connected through Chris Lukey, Manufacturing mm -hmm. Happy Hour. Man, way before COVID. We've become fast friends. Damon, when you stay next to these two, are these are twin towers. These are two yeah, big groups no that doubt. we're talking with right here. Max, you and I had the honor and privilege. We connected years ago. I was doing a LinkedIn workshop. I think this was like maybe 2013, 14. Yep. You were at that workshop and you and I became fast friends. And so, you know, and and man, I want to, we're going to dig into your work and your business kick things off. Like, uh, you know, you went to St. Bonaventure MBA, you've worked at Cummins, you know, a uh, major manufacturer. You've worked at GE. Uh, we, Damon, you and I talk about the MEPs a lot. Max has done great work with the Buffalo MEP, the uh, Pennsylvania MEPs. Mm -hmm. Max, what drove your superpowers, bringing your talents, your skills, uh, your passion to the world of manufacturing? How did that get started early in your career? Yeah. So my education is in industrial engineering. So of course, industrial engineering, one of the main places that people go for their careers in manufacturing. So I started out of school at Bush Industries here in town mm -hmm. and worked as an industrial engineer. I was the first industrial engineer that they hired. So I really got into manufacturing, learning about how a business works, learning about mm -hmm. systems, about processes, about ERP systems. It's like the whole gamut. Cause I was like, it was a growing company like crazy. And so I got to be involved in a lot of different things. Right. Yeah. And you caught the early wave, great company. So Damon, this is a furniture manufacturer, Bush Industries. They do office furniture, great company. And then Max, you slid into, you know, if I'm not mistaken, you have other uh, major companies on your resume that you transferred, uh, you know, brought your talents to, like we mentioned, Cummins, GE, the MEP world. Talk about like how you've continued on this great legacy through all these years, you know, really striving on efficiency and, you know, maximizing those uh, uh, effectiveness is the word that you yep. like to use for yep. manufacturers. Yeah. So I actually went and worked for the Buffalo MEP for 10 years. So I was director of their consulting services mm -hmm. and, you know, I had the strong manufacturing background going in there. And then when I started working there, of course, they provide all this unbelievable training. So mm -hmm. I got training in lean. I was a, my boss at the time, actually worked for dr Deming. <laughs> oh so wow she was like oh, wow. i mean yeah she was a oh, huge wow. influence on me You're right to the heart so i learned there. so much about total quality from her and then um i got introduced to dr goldratt through that through yeah. a company that i worked with and it's like that was like changing my life i mean that was my like like, experience <laughs> yeah change your life so guys so we've got hey wow. we've got we've hey diane gives a little shout out you know hey that's a very very humble uh very humble view diane giving a shout out to whitney on the astros she's sending cheesecakes and pretzels david chrysler says hey this is epic right now that i agree with you 100 yeah. david we've got a great crew you know good conversation going here so david let me slide over to you a little bit okay so again, you know, your passion, your skills, your expertise mm -hmm. brought it to manufacturing. Why manufacturing? You could have gone in multiple different directions. You could have gone in different industries. Mm -hmm. What attracted you to manufacturing? Well, Kurt, I like to tell people that I, that I tried a bunch of different in industries and manufacturing just continued to, uh, to, to pull me back, right? So um, my technical background is in aviation. I went down to get certified uh, to, to work on, on basically anything that flies uh, th through the FAA, right? So spent a lot of time wrenching on things and learning to troubleshoot and then came out and thought that I was going to work more specifically in aviation. Um, the economy was doing kind of flips, not all that different than, than what we may be seeing at the moment. Yeah. Um, decided that I didn't want to get kind of pigeon held into bending sheet metal for the next 30 or 40 years of my life. And uh, I ended up taking a job uh, for a German based company that had a location in the US and they build the large gantry style machines that drill and rivet airplane fuselages together. Right. And I'm like, yeah, yeah I, I can go work in this while I'm, I'm continuing college. And then it became the hey, we need someone to go help rebuild a supply chain. So let's go talk to 50 or 100 or 200 different, you know, machine shops and 
Western New York and let's go find some fixture places in Detroit and let's go kind of rebuild all of this. And then, oh, we have one engineer in the US and she's about to leave on maternity leave. So Dave, <laughs> good luck, right? And so it's, it's just a series of things that kind of continue to, to drive me down into this. And at the core, Kurt, I would say I love solving problems, right? So everything I do, be it, you know, podcasting or kind of doing marketing stuff or, or sales stuff or going and doing kind of the, the hands-on technical nuts and bolts of, of solving manufacturing problems is, is I love solving problems. And in my opinion, uh, manufacturing is still the wild west, right? Like like so many other places are in, are in the 2020s and like we have phones and like computers and you walk out into a manufacturing floor and, and I swear to God, uh, last month I was out at a place, they were starting up a new line that hadn't run well in more than, hadn't run in four years, hadn't run well in at least a decade. And literally they found a bunch of one page learnings. It was just covered in dust and you could just go and just blow and the dust flies off of them, right? And, and now mind you, no one had any idea of if these were still valid because they, they like stole a bunch of stuff from other lines in order to get this line up and running. Right. And, and a bunch of stuff from that line had been stolen for, for lines that are currently running. So, I mean, it, it's the Wild West. We, we've got a stack of information that may or may not be valid. And we're sending people <laughs> to another facility four hours away for a week at a time, not knowing how close their line runs to the line that we just started up. And it's like, well, now we have to produce. And so, uh, so good luck. So... All right, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack right there. So now, now, and I forget, I, I, you know, I'm Damon. You know, I'm not a young guy anymore. Max, you know, Max knows that well. So I'm a little forgetful now. Max, did you say that you're the introvert and Dave's the extrovert? I can't remember yes. which, which is which, right? So, yes. so Dave, you're the you're the engineer that like you know you're 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 the oddball where like you just have this amazing magnetic just dynamic personality was that from was that from grandma was that from the two grandmas that i, I think so probably yes I, I guess i guess uh, as, as max likes to joke he's the introvert right he's the introverted <laughs> engineer and so i have to be the extroverted sales guy but then, then it'll flip and max will go on and talk for 20 minutes about something he's yeah. really passionate about and i will just like kind of stand back and, and let him have uh have these conversations i would probably say i'm the most introverted person in the family just to the reason i talk so much <laughs> is because the family is just so loud if, if you're not ready to to get in there yeah. um th then you're just going to go all to dinner without saying a single word yeah and then people look at you and be like what's wrong with you dave why are you so quiet and here's the funny thing about max max says he's an introvert i can tell you time and time again i'll be standing with max and his wife will be at figure skating practice and like we're literally crying like i like he, he he's one of the funniest human beings i've ever met like i can't breathe where he's just killing me but yet he's an introvert so max i'm going to come back you awesome. mentioned the, you mentioned dr gold rap for David Chrysler, our dear friend, probably knows yeah. this one, of course. Damon, you know this. This book was a game changer. I fully admit I'm embarrassed I did not know this book until I met my dear friend, Max. It, we're talking about the goal. Mm -hmm. Max, please talk about Dr. Goldrat. Talk about the goal and why anybody in business, I don't care what sector you're in, what industry you're in, what department you're in, you should read the goal. Max, please share with everybody, what is the book, The Goal? Yeah, so the book, The Goal, is a book written about manufacturing. So it's actually Dr. Goldratt's experience from three different plants that he took and wrote this yeah. book about his experience with these three plants. And it's funny because he calls the goal the Bible of manufacturing. He goes, you know what the definition of the Bible is? Everybody believes it. Nobody does it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's classic. <laughs> So it's basically a turnaround story of mm -hmm. a company, right? And how the, so the Jonah in the story was a professor that was trained in the early systems thinking and taught this plant manager how to turn the plant around by looking at it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So that's the basis of the story. So if you haven't read it, you got to read the book because it's an yeah. unbelievable story. There's unbelievable knowledge in that book. It's like, you got to not just read it. You need to like sit back and understand what, What's being portrayed is the, the backstory behind what's the logic and the theory behind the story. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so a lot and of it, layers in that thing. There's a lot of layers in that book. And so, uh, so again, guys, if this book is new to you, go out, check out, encourage you, invite you, welcome you, beg you, implore you, buy the book, The Goal. And it is a total game changer. Now, Max, that in the book, it's the theory of constraints. And when you and I met, you are a theory of constraints. There it is right there. Thank you, Damon. Yep. There's the goal right there. 
Guys, go out and grab that. It's on Amazon for $9.99. I don't know how much it is, but <laughs> grab that book, and, and boy, it'll be a game changer. Now, Max, that is the theory of constraints is the, is the basis mm-hmm. of that book. Sure, what is the theory of constraints? So theory of constraints. So Dr. Goldratt was a physicist. So what he did is he took physics and he applied that to manufacturing. And so it's really about systems thinking. So when you look at any system, there's very few elements that control that system. So if you can understand what elements control the system, you can improve the system performance significantly by changing a few minor things. So my cat's going to come visit here. Oh, you're more than <laughs> <Yeah>. welcome. <laughs> hey. And it's amazing too. It's just amazing when you when you understand that and you can look at large facilities and and it can be there we go. <laughs> you can have large manufacturing facilities and boil it down into one spot. Yep. That controls the output of, you know, hundreds the whole of system. people's efforts. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and our buddy David Chrysler, hey, he read it a few times. He catches something every time. There and then you the go. he shared it in there. Oh, he's even got the link there. Awesome, nice. Dave. <laughs> link right in there, David. So, thank you, brother. Appreciate you, Dave Griffith. Let's uh, come get you back on stage here, brother. Let's talk about again. There were different aspects of manufacturing mm-hmm. that you could have gone into. You are super passionate about uh, process improvement, in particular mm-hmm. technology. Just share, like, what tr- what attracted you to go that direction in manufacturing on these efficiencies. Yeah, absolutely. So on on my side, I I have seen lots of people be successful to kind of varying degrees when you talk about, you know, theory of constraints and lean and Six Sigma. Uh, You know, some people are are very successful, uh, like Max, in in helping to uh, to, to take that and and help to enact change. But what I found is kind of the, the newer generation uh, wants more information at their fingertips, right? Like they want to be able to see what's happening in their plant so that they can make decisions quicker. They want to take digital and technology and put it on the floor. And we want to talk about artificial intelligence and, and augmented reality. And, and how can we put that on the floor? And that gives us the ability to train and retain better talent, which is something that we have struggled in in manufacturing for at least as long as I've been alive, if not long, right? Probably forever. Uh, we've always struggled to find and retain, you know, good talent. And so these pieces of technology allow us to, you know, we're probably never going to be as awesome as an Amazon or a Facebook or any of those things, but it is going to allow us to bring some people in and train and retain some of that good top talent. And so my goal has always been, how can we take these thoughts and methodologies and leverage that using technology so that either we understand kind of everything that goes along in the theory of constraints or lean or six sigma um and kind of explain that or how can we take the technology and kind of forcibly allow us to do that while getting these efficiencies and these additional outputs man i i absolutely go ahead david no i just think this this is one of the coolest parts of manufacturing now is the enabling the technology that's enabling us to help train, retain, and give people more of the information they need to make decisions right at the at the point that they need them. And, and when you think about what that's going to do for future generations of manufacturing, mm-hmm. it's going to be incredible. Absolutely. And j- just to kind of add, add to that, Damon, I guess I, I see that we're going to have a, a big issue in the next five years or so, kind of when all of the people who actually know how processes work they're all going to retire. Yes. They're going to be there are going to be very few of us left that actually understand how to figure out what the process is yep. supposed to be. And there will be not an insignificant number of phone calls to the, I don't know, 100 people who know how to actually go figure out what a process is yeah. to go kind of figure out a plant's process from scratch. And you're going to be ground to the halt for weeks or months at a time as someone like a me or a Max goes to try to figure out, hey, this is what we should have done. I don't know why we didn't collect any of this data or this information for the last 50 years, but this looks like how it's supposed to be. Let's go run it a a couple hundred times. And if it doesn't break, let's just assume that this is how we are supposed to run this segment of the plant and then go to the next part. Yeah. Yeah. So I had one company that actually called the gray tsunami. Mm -hmm. Yeah, (laughs) it is. It is. It, it is. And and we we were if some people talk about technology obsoleting workers, and I'm like, you know, that's not even no. don't even think about that. But that technology needs to be there because we have workers that are going to retire at a rate in manufacturing that if we don't implement the technology harder than we're in or mm-hmm. more aggressively than we mm-hmm. are today, 
we aren't going to have people to fill the positions. Right. Yep. Now, I, I, I worked with an organization and they had one guy who was really good at rebuilding valves, right? And there were probably only like 4,000 valves in this facility, but he was really good at rebuilding valves. He was yeah. the valve guy. Right. I'd done it for 45 years. Yeah. And then March or April, he retired. And you want to know who can rebuild valves? Him when he comes back on contract work, uh, you yeah. know, <laughs> once yeah. a quarter. Uh, yeah. But but beyond that, literally, we have no instructions or understanding on how to rebuild valves. And right. that's just a, a small part of what's going to get larger and larger. And if we don't take technology or other things to capture this information, it's going to be gone. And in not too many years, they're going to retire and move away or retire and decide they don't want to come back to work for the same yeah. facility they did every day for 45 years. And and then you're just going to shrug your shoulders and have to learn the hard way how we rebuild these things. Right. Yes. Right. And I mean, it's simple stuff today, too. I mean, you can literally be be videotaping this stuff on your phone at the very least. Yep. So you got some sort of record. Right. Yep. Right. Absolutely. No record is disaster. Yeah. Yeah. So- Dave, dude, you're a young man. You've got you've got job security for like yeah. years and decades to come, my friend. And so Good you stuff. keep running that pavement. We're gonna get into like you do a great job with podcasts and everything you're working on, Max. I'm gonna slide over to you. So I have a hysterical story when I met Max. So it was probably 2014 ish. We uh, we're at a LinkedIn workshop and Max is there, and so uh, you know we get together and meet up afterwards. And I'm and and again theory of constraints, the goal, all brand new to me. So I have this office and he sits down and I'm like, so Max, tell me about your business. And he's like, well, you know, it goes, uh, you know, theory of constraints and I want to be the right knee guy. And he just kept talking. And I'm like, what? I go, wait, I thought, like I literally throw, I'm like, dude, time out. You gave him the I, time out. Oh, I, no. go, I go, I caught most of what you said. I go, did you just say the right knee guy? He goes, yeah, I want to be the right knee guy. I go, Max, what on earth is the right knee guy? Max, do you want? I'll I'll, I'll tell it. You yeah. tell it. <laughs> he looks at me and he goes, "If you injure your right knee, who are you going to go to? Are you going to go to like the general practitioner, the guy that's helping the cold and the flu, and one you know he's stitching up somebody one minute, like just doing a little bit of everything, or do you want to go to like the world renowned authority expert on the right knee? The same." doctor that takes care of like the local professional athlete and just repairs everything. He goes, I want to be so specialized. If somebody, if you've hurt your left knee, I'm not your guy. I don't know a darn thing about the left knee. You hurt anything else on your body. I'm not your person. I can't help you, but boy, gosh, darn it. If you've hurt your right knee, I'm the world renowned expert on the right knee. That's what I want to be with the theory constraints. I'm for like, manufacturing, right? I'm like, dude, drop the mic. It was like, yeah. it was more like, like there were like trumpets playing, Damon, angels. Were playing. down. I was like, I'm like, dude, that was like one of the best. And and I I use that, I use that story over and over. I was an advisor with the small business development center. Mm-hmm. So I started using it. Max, man, I probably owe you money for this. Every client that I worked with, I would use that story. So this woman comes in. I hadn't seen her in months. She's a millennial. She's tatted up. She's got the piercings. I hadn't seen her like in a year. And she sits in my office. I'm like, hey, how's it going? She goes, well, you know, I'm trying to be the right knee girl. I'm like, the right knee girl. I go, I told you that story. She goes, of course you told me that story. She goes, I think about it every day. I want to be the right knee girl of the space that she was in. So Max, Share with everybody, why is it so important to niche down? We call it niche down until it hurts and stay laser focused and be that right knee guy or that right knee gal. Yeah. So it's like, you got to have the depth of knowledge to be able to help companies. I got to have super deep knowledge of concepts, right? To be able to look at an organization and understand what's preventing them from getting better performance. But you also need a broad business sense. So I spent my whole career learning about business, the broad business sense, but I wanted to be super deep knowledgeable about subject matters to help transform companies. And it's like, the first question is like, okay, we got this organization, we're not doing so well. So the first question is, what do we change? Well, Mm -hmm. if you talk to everybody in the company, you're gonna have three ideas from every person in the company. So you're gonna have 300 ideas of what we need to change. It's like, you can't, it's all about focus, right? You can't work on 300 initiatives. And Dave and I see it in companies. They have all these initiatives going. And when you look at the ones that are actually 
converting the company to improve performance? Sometimes never, none of them. Yeah, sometimes none. <laughs> too, too often none, in fact. Yeah. So we worked on a project together. We interviewed everybody in the company, and they're like, we know where the biggest problem is. <laughs> and we're like, who's working on it? <laughs> Nobody. No. So, all right, Max, so let's go here. So you do an amazing job. I've had the honor and privilege of going through, you do webinars, workshops, training. You've taught me, you've taken me through exercises that I literally use on a daily basis. You know, you have uh, the ripping game and all these games that you have, uh, you know, folks in, in your, your audience that, that learn. Share a little bit about like your, you know, how you're training and boy, you just, you get rave reviews everywhere you go when you do these trainings just share a little bit about like what what would people expect at your trainings and how do you how do you attack those for folks yeah so i'm a hands-on learner so we teach the concepts and then we do exercises to reinforce the concepts so mm -hmm. it's learned by doing but what i found was that in companies to get breakthrough performance you need to change the mindset so these games are done to change the perception that people have about different subjects whether it's costing, whether it's flow, whether it's problem solving. Mm -hmm. And so it's like when I see the issues in a company, I'm looking at, okay, so these six mindsets need to be changed. So I do the training and reinforce the concepts of what the correct mindset needs to be. So it's all about mindset. So like so we, with you, with the paper ripping, right? It's like, right. oh, we need to be good multitaskers. No, <laughs> we need yeah. to be able to take one task and run it to ground and complete mm -hmm. it. Right. Right? <laughs> right. So Dave, you're nodding up a storm here, dude. So share a little bit like your experience with like, you know, trying to help educate, you know, manufacturers are just, they're so busy, especially these entrepreneurs, the smaller ones where like, you know, one minute they're their own HR department. The next minute mm -hmm. they're their own finance department. Next, they're trying to be marketing. You know, it's hard to be, you know, it's very difficult, challenging for an, a manufacturer to be an expert in all of these. That's why it's so critical for you guys to come in and help elevate their game. Talk about like some of the game, some of the things that you've seen by going through these trainings with manufacturers. Absolutely. So, so I would say Max and I have gone through a number of these trainings and facilitated a number of these trainings together. And, and I think almost to a one there, there's always at least one of those eye-opening moments right so so I, I was laughing when, when kurt said he's stolen max's paper ripping game i have also stolen max's paper ripping game although i'm, <laughs> I'm fairly confident i have asked max if i can uh borrow his outline of the paper ripping game right so so focus right so i, I think focus is is one of the kind of lowest pieces of hanging fruit that any group is missing and if you can focus on whatever task you're working on you've got a huge chance to succeed. I would also say focus is absolutely the hardest thing in order to actually claim of, of people's time and of people's mental energy, regardless of, I need to go show you guys why it's important to focus. We, we've gone through the paper ripping game. Everyone's agreed we need to focus. And then I see people sending emails 12 minutes later um, in, in the middle of these workshops. So I think it's important <laughs> to, to go and like you go uh, through through Max's process, we, we do a bunch of interviews, right? We, we go and highlight some problems. We go do some workshops to kind of say, hey, this is what we have to do to go solve the problems. But then you actively have to go out there and be out there to help them solve the problems and show that it works, right? So, so showing that we need to focus or that we need to get better in one area works well uh, for, again, that 12-minute segment. But if you can repetitively go and yeah. work with different groups who are actually performing these tasks, and show them how their jobs get better, their lives get less stressful, mm -hmm. they can also be more productive by literally doing less things, then th that is where you see the, the breakthrough success, the breakthrough performance, which is always the goal when we come in to talk about efficiency at a manufacturing facility. You know, I love that. And so I have a buddy who's a, a football coach, very successful football coach, and his father always said, you know what? It's simple, but it's not always easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So many yep. things in life are simple, simple but, but it's not always easy. You know, Dave, why is it, why is it not easy? Why is it so challenging? You know, and I'm, I'm throwing myself under the bus as well. Like, you know, why is it so easy? Why is it so difficult for us to focus? I think it's difficult to focus because throughout our entire lives, we always have all of these inputs, right? So, so you, you know, the last 15 years we, we've all had smartphones, but like before that, uh, you know, you're working the floor, you're in operations, there's a problem, you go run to to go sit, to go put out that fire. 
And then yeah. hopefully you get to the end of putting out that fire before the next fire comes on. And then some at, at some point you're eight, nine, 12 hours into your shift and you're like, oh, I didn't do any of the things that I had scheduled to do today. I didn't write any of the reports. Yeah. I didn't look at the previous stuff. I have no idea what the schedule is supposed to be. And so that stuff just gets pushed to the back until something again is on fire. And, and it might be those things that are on fire. And so it's just this constant cycle. And now we've got all of these other inputs, right? So we, we've got all of these other inputs. We've got a phone. Maybe you've got the boss calling you, you you have to go do 20 interviews today because we don't have enough people to work third shift. Like it, it, it's, it consistently gets worse. The, the most successful people we see are people that can go block their time and actually focus on things. And, and I have found, especially working remotely, is that sometimes if you go lock yourself into your room, you can go do eight or 10 hours of work in two hours. Like you yeah. just have to be able to sit yeah. down in order to get it done. And many times people are just spending another six or eight hours doing busy work or, yeah. or other things as opposed to just focusing on the task at hand. Right. Absolutely. And, 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 and what I see is that people are focusing on putting out the fire, but nobody's looking at where, what was the spark that started the fire. Yep. Yes. If we prevent the spark from happening, there's no fire. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, uh, hey, we had a great comment here from Diane. She, uh, let's see, putting out fire. Oh, that's from Whitney. Putting out fires is a huge time suck. Mm -hmm. And then mine, been trained to multitask, right? Hey, let's mm -hmm. do five different things. Yeah, we're rewarded for multitasking. Yes. We're totally rewarded. And again, like, you know, guys, yeah. and if you're curious about some of these games, this training, you have to connect with Max, drop him a note. And he has some really powerful uh, little tools, exercises to help you be more efficient. Max, you and I, you've shared, you know, mind blowing story after mind blowing story with, with, with myself. Uh, you know, talk about like the resistance or the challenges that you face with talking with executives or what have you. And when you get to the other side, like I love when you share those, those aha moments, you've shared numerous of those light, when the light bulb goes off, talk about that resistance and then how you break down that resistance to get folks to the other side. Yeah. So, you know, when I was training from Dr. Golrat, how to overcome resistance. So the first thing is like, we need to agree that there's a problem. But when I go <laughs> yeah. to the company, it's like, they don't even think there's a problem. Right. And it's like, and what I see is that companies have been dealing with problems for so long, it becomes normal condition. Right. And right. so like, I went work with a construction company, right. And the construction company is like, Oh, after we finish the job, the owner walks through and we have this punch list. I go, what is that? It's like all the problems ah. that we need to fix. It's yeah. like, what? Yeah. Oh, that's normal for the construction industry. I go, not in any other industry. It's not. It's like, yeah. what? When you get a new car, you go through and say, oh, here's all the problems with the new car that the manufacturer needs to fix before I take it. What is that? Right. Yeah. Right. And it's just the mindset that's like, oh, that's how it's done. It's like, yeah, but not in any other industry it's done that way so they get in this mindset where problems become normal condition and they can't get out of that mindset and so the first thing is like is there really a problem and what is the problem so you got to take walk them through the layers of resistance to get them to see it's like i can give solutions all day long but if they don't understand what problem that's solving mm -hmm. it doesn't mean anything right so let all right. So let's take a step further. So when 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 you identify, obviously, you know, somebody's come to your workshop, a training, and so th these are folks that I get past that where they say, "Yes, I do have a problem." Doctor Max, can you come in and help us? Right? Talk a little bit about like when that aha moment comes through, or when you start identifying some of these challenges. Yeah. You know, so people are good at identifying the symptoms. So it's like, oh, we have too many late orders. We're constantly expediting. We have you know, expedited freight costs. It's like, but they don't understand what's causing it. Mm -hmm. So part of my training is to get them to understand what's the root cause of those problems. And when we can understand the root cause, and then when I can recalibrate their mindset about the root cause, that's where the light bulb comes on, right? So the belief is like, oh, we need to be good multitaskers, right? But multitasking is terrible for productivity and quality. So when we say, man, if you can focus, you can knock out, three times the work when you're not multitasking, but we are just trained, right? There's all these concepts that we were trained that I don't know where they came from, but, and then it's the wrong mindset. Right. Dave, what, how about from your side of things on the technology, 
technology side, when you say you're facing some resistance, mm-hmm. but then people are like, you know, maybe they cry uncle or maybe it's just yep. a situation like, man, this just can't continue. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe there's an upset, co- you know, like some, unfortunately, sometimes it's something reactive. It's a lost customer. It's, you know, quality mm-hmm. issues, something that finally triggers, hey, uh, I'm going to throw in a towel here. I need mm-hmm. help. But what, from your perspective, what do you see? And then how do you get people to the other side of, you know, that light bulb moment? Absolutely. I, I would I would agree. I would, I'd say that those are all great, uh, great statements, Kurt. So I'm going to go with talking about the light bulb moment, right? So yes. I think the light bulb moment is important, especially when we talk about technology implementations, right? Mm-hmm. So I could go and build out the, the best piece of technology and kind of push it out. And Max and I could go live in a place and force people to use it and sit in the 7 a.m. meetings and the, the 11 a.m. and sit in every meeting for six months and then as soon as we leave, they're just going to stop using it because they're comfortable in what they were doing. So, so that they need yep. some sort of moment in order to say, yes, this is why, why we need to do it. So I, I was, as, as I said earlier, I was just working with a client uh, at, uh, for the first half of October, working on some digital work instructions as part of this platform that we're having, right? And so I actually found this, right? So they, they were, they had supposedly rolled it out, right? So I get there and I was going to do like second, third phase of this rollout and work individually with people. And I go and I talk to the first 20 people and they're like, Dave, I've got no idea what you're talking about, right? Like the person who was supposed to did it, like we spent an entire hour and none of us got logged into our devices. And then that's it. I'm like, well, this makes a lot of sense. So we had to go completely rework everything that we were doing. And, and I went, I did some digging and I found that it's got the opportunity to go print QR codes for specific work instructions, right? And so I go take these QR codes and I slap them up on the machine and either for particular work points or for particular issues that people have all of the time, sometimes they're cleaning instructions. It really depends upon the machine, right? And so I go and I'm, I'm re-rolling this stuff out to the operators and some of them are like, lukewarm lukewarm is about as good as we got right so so like lukewarm to like exceptionally negative and i would say some everyone so like 90 95 percent of them like we got to the what what did this guy bleeping get us into now i'm very upset with him right so so this is what they're saying about their own engineer and i'm like well i understand what you're saying but I'm here and I'm over here like, guys, I get paid the same amount, whether you guys want to use it or not. So can we at least like roll through it and show you? So, so, so we got some pushback. We got them all logged into their devices in like 10 minutes. And then we just walked out on the floor and I, I just point, I told them to point the iPad at the, at the QR code and scan it. And they looked at it and they're like, oh, this is amazing. Like 95% of them, it was that aha moment. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, we have them. Now I just need to roll this out to 600 other places on the floor. But as soon as you get the aha moment, the, the, their use in the last two, two and a half weeks has been like 600, a thousand percent above what it had been before because we showed them a reason that would help them in particular. Yeah. And we worked with the operators. We worked with the mechanics. We worked with the supervisors, right? Like everyone has to have a reason to go in and log in. And if yes. we're th- then giving people reasons to go in and log in, then th- then they're going to adopt the technology, but it has to make their lives easier. Yes. If it doesn't make their lives easier, they're not going to use it. And honestly, if it doesn't make their lives easier, I'm not going to go waste a couple of weeks of my life going uh, going to help them out, no yeah. matter how sunny a uh, facility <laughs> might be while I'm in the conference room or in the facility, because they're all dark and uh, dark and dreary by the time I get to leave or by the time I get to drive back in the morning. Right. Yeah, so that's an important point because it's like, so what is difficult for us when we're doing these large transformations is sometimes for the system to be efficient, most operations need to be less efficient. And that's hard for people to understand. Mm -hmm. So it's like, was one company we went into where we, we increased the number of work orders on the floor by 10 X because they had these huge orders. So we cut the order batch by 10. Yep. So now the people in production control need to write or need to print 10 times as many work orders. Mm -hmm. And they're like, this isn't efficient for us. Yeah, but it's efficient for the system because we can control the flow now in production. So that's the other thing that's hard for people is like for the system to be efficient, no, most steps need to be less efficient and people can't get that through their head. <laughs> right. Okay. Man, this is <laughs> yeah. This is so 
Good, man. There's some really good comments here. You're speaking my language today, identifying problems. Yep. And then I love good this. Stuff. She's going, Diane's going to go home with whiplash because yeah. she's nodding so much in agreement. <laughs> David says he loves the QR code. And so Whitney agrees. Dude, I think that that is new to me. All right, Max, let's go here, dude. I mean, we're just, let's keep this. We're on fire right now. I knew this was going to be good. <laughs> So let's, you know, again, like you've shared multiple, multiple case studies with me over the years. You know, we're standing there together. You're like, oh, Kurt, you know, this throughput, this, you know, like talk about the throughput, the big dynamic changes when like, even if, like you said, you have to take a step back to get those second, third, four steps forward. Talk a little bit about some of the wins or some things that folks could expect as we're having this conversation here. Yeah. So if you haven't gone through any type of what I call formal process improvement. So we do a lot of point solutions, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of companies do, oh, we're going to do a setup reduction here. We're going to do 5S over here. We're yeah. going to do, you know, quality initiative here. And it's like, that's the point solution concept. It's like, I, that's where I started my career and I wasn't getting results from companies. Yep. So it's so frustrating for me. It's like, we did all these changes and nothing's getting better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like delivery performance hasn't increased. Inventory hasn't gone down. Lead time hasn't gone down. Mm -hmm. Quality issues haven't gone down. It's like, what are we doing? And then I yeah. started to learn more from Dr. Goldrad about the system thinking. It's like, okay, I need to step back and look at it from a system perspective and understand like, where are the leverage points? So leverage points is where we can apply some techniques and get huge benefit for the system. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. And so, and it's like, you got to have the system stable. So what I learned from Dr. Deming is if you have an unstable system, doing point solutions is actually going to make it worse. Yes. People try to do these continuous improvement events and things get worse, meaning inventory goes up even more, mm -hmm. right? More quality issues. Maybe that one operation is doing better, but from a system we're doing worse. So yeah. it's like, you got to step back and say, okay, understand what's the cause and effect happening in the system. Where are the leverage points? And if we can focus there, it's all about making that leverage point more efficient and in most cases, need, other people need to be less efficient to make that one point more efficient. And that's super hard for companies. It's like, because we've been trained our whole life and like, be efficient, be efficient, be efficient. And we come and say, nope, don't be efficient. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. what are you talking about? What are you nuts? <laughs> right. Well, and I think, you know, like yourself, when you, you, you speak of theory of constraints and the things like Deming, uh, interchangeably almost but when when you apply it the theory of constraints is so nice because it allows you to go okay here's where we should focus yep mm -hmm. and then you talk about because we know that is a lever point for the entire business yep. and then you and then you go in there and you can use some of the deming six sigma kind of stuff in there if that is correct mm -hmm. to do it That's but, exactly right but you're totally right because it's like i love the the a graphic that you'll see people use sometimes where it's like two big pipes with a little teeny pipe in the middle. That's like that yeah. pipe, that little teeny section is what's limiting your business. And you're right. All these endpoint solutions all around here for doing all the, those little specific improvements. Don't do a thing for the business until you get that little pipe bigger yep. and, mm -hmm. and let the flow through, go, go faster. It's yep. cool. So, Max, what are some tips, advice? So, so for folks are out there, and again, like, see, manufacturers, like, man, I, I, I hear you. I love this. I still, I'm still stuck. I have exactly what Damon just described. I've got mm -hmm. the two big pipes with a little pipe. Max, how do you help folks identify those constraints, and how do you help remove those? Let me start with how do you help folks identify those constraints? <laughs> That's a tough That's question. It's an easy question, Kurt. Thank you for giving it to Max. <laughs> <laughs> I did that just for so, Dave. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so it's funny because when I go and I start doing training with companies and we start the project, I ask people where they think the constraint is. You know how many companies were correct? Zero. Zero. Ah, isn't that fascinating? Why is that, Max? Because they're making an assumption based on the current system. And when you change the system, the whole dynamics change. So I went into one company. It's like, they said, oh, our constraints in our layout department. I said, okay, let's take a walk out there. So we walk out there and say, okay, why is it the layout department? Look at all the parts waiting to go through layout. It's like they're all piled up here. So I start talking to the operators. I said, okay, so how many shifts you run? Oh, we're running three shifts, seven days a week. 
I'm like, well, what's your utilization? They look at me like, you know, dog turned the head sideways. Like, what? What? I go, how many hours are you actually working on parts? They're like, that's a good question. I said, they said, most of these parts here, we have to, because it's aerospace, we have to take a core sample. We send it out to a lab to get the core sample, you know, tested. And when it comes back and we have a good, you know, core sample test, we start processing it. And so I go to the plant manager, I go, so I just have one question for you. How many of these tests fail the, the, the you know, materials test? He's like, less than 1%. Then why are you holding them? <laughs> Everyone has a serial number. If it fails the test, we can we know where it is. We can pull it out downstream. Mm -hmm. So we change that policy. We don't have to wait for the test to come back to, pr to process them. The floodgates open. Yep. It's like yep. mind blowing. It's a different place. So you do there was like a policy that. that they had that it's like, oh, we don't release the product until we get the test results. But the risk is so small. Right. Stop doing that. The policy was the was the constraint. Dave, uh, you know, throwing on your technology hat when you and Max tag team projects together. Mm -hmm. How about from from your world? What are some things that you see as culprits or, you know, the, the, the criminals out there that are causing these constraints that you're finding? Yeah. So I, I'm certainly seeing it many times their communication issues, right? Like okay. one group, as Max said, one group does something that they think to their best of abilities to potentially maximize the, their time. And then the next group is, is punished by it. Right. So Max and I did a project um, at a brewery. Right. So they were making beer. They were making uh, a bunch of hard seltzers and things like that. And so everyone in the cellar, everyone in all of the tanks was always complaining about everything that they had to do and how the schedule was so screwed up. And they never knew when something was going to get pulled to actually go get canned because it could be the day it was said or it literally could be two weeks later. Right. So it caused them all of these issues. And it wasn't infrequent that they literally had to go dump hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of sold product because it had timed out in the tanks. And so you go, you talk to the, the folks doing the actual canning and they're like, oh, this is terrible. Like uh, I, I did the calculations one week, they were down like 20 hours because they were trying to get the tanks prepared in order to go run it through the can line, right? And so I'm like, guys, there has got to be, an, like one side is getting hammered on this because they never know when it's ready. The other side is getting hammered because it's never ready when they need to run it. And they also never know when they need to run it because the schedule changes six times a day. Um, I'm like, what can we do? So, so we actually went and built, uh, it's, it's basically like a Google Doc, right? So, so we went, we built a Google Doc. There were a couple of checks in there and, and we basically just increased, all, well, we didn't increase. We just started the slightest bit of, of the ability to communicate with two groups literally separated by 20 feet on the plant floor. And yeah. basically overnight, we had $200,000 a month of issues going away, right? Like we, we, we just rolled it out and it was gone because they're like, oh, we should just talk to the other person. And, and these guys in the cellar absolutely want to get the tanks ready so that we don't have to go bug them when there's only one person ready. And, and, and the guys in the cellar are like, yeah, we absolutely want to get these ready because we've got three other things that need to go in this tank. We don't want them screwing around with our tanks for four hours uh, in the yeah. middle of every shift. And, and so you just provide people with the ability to solve their problems. And most of the time, people will solve their problems. And th that's kind of one of the, the core tenets when, when I go talk with groups is that, I mean, substantially in a good, stable organization, um, which is kind of the goal to, to work with, they know generally 90% of what they need to succeed, right? Like the, the, the biggest, lowest hanging fruit is asking them the correct questions and facilitating the correct conversations. And, and I have kind of niched down uh, beyond kind of as Max described it, right? Like I want to go and find jobs that more than pay for themselves in the shortest amount of time and the question is, how can I facilitate these conversations in two or three days, right? And yeah. part of that is bringing the right people together. And part of the reason I want to do it in two, three days is because you cannot keep people's focus for a week or for two weeks because they already have 20 hours a day of work to do. So I just, I literally am trying to get like 15, 20 hours of focus out of, you know, a group of cross-functional people. And I, I like the, the majority of it is, guys, go write down these ideas. Let's figure out if they're profitable. If they're profitable, like we can just implement them, right? Like if we yeah. can go save $2 million a year on this idea, the bosses would be a fool to say no, regardless if it takes technology or not. Like 
if we can go find projects that pay for themselves, we're just going to move on to the next project because no one would ever say no if we've already been successful. Yeah, yeah tell the refinery story, Dave. Oh yeah, so uh, so, so Max and I uh, last year last year when I drove back to Western New York, um, I got here. Max and I talked like twenty minutes after I pulled into uh, to Buffalo, and Max is like, "Yeah, this refinery that Max and I did a design sprint for uh, 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 the year before, earlier that year, is having problems. Right? They, they have." basically derated their ability to run by something like 80%, right? So so typically, well, let's we'll say they, they typically run about a million dollars a day and they're running like $200,000 a day uh, worth, of, worth of product uh, through uh, th- through this upgraded system that, that they had done. They just so, rebuilt it, right? So. Yeah, they, they rebuilt it. They, they made some basically no changes, but they've derated themselves something like 80%. So Max and I, Max and I show up, and I guess, long story short, we, we got a little bit of focus. We we sat in a very hot conference room that allegedly had air conditioning running, uh, but we were all sweating uh, pretty good by the by the time we were done. Um, and and I, I guess, long story short, we, we did some troubleshooting, and we're like, okay, guys, what's different now than last year? And we looked at some historical data, and I guess, long story short, the compressors were j- just continuing to push the, the PSI in the airlines up and up and up. And it was like 30% above what it was five years ago when they were running well. They also had some different raw materials that came in. And so so basically their relief valve continued to get bumped higher and higher and higher. And we, we basically just dropped the PSI and the relief valve by something like five, six, seven PSI. And, and we pushed an extra half a million, $750,000 a day worth of process through the lines. Just... I don't know. Max and I should have gotten paid more for that. It was, it was, it was a, again, yeah. it was a hot, sweaty six hours in a, in an alleged uh, conference room that was air conditioned. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. You should got, yeah, something for hardship there for that. Yeah. Oh, a- absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. so they, yeah, they, I don't even think they brought drinks in with lunch. Okay. All right. So, first off, God, this is so good. I, I David Tracer says, too much. So, guys, on our program, David, we call them moments of silence when like you guys are just dropping the mic, just just incredible value bombs over and over and over. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Diane. Uh, we, we got tons of great comments here. So yeah, you guys get a chance here. You know, uh, you know, if, if we all knew what we don't know, that is the cause of the problem. You yep. know, and able to fix it ourselves. Yep. So, guys, I want to be mindful of time. I know we've got a hard stop coming up here. So. Man, this was so good. All right, so first off, a couple of things I want to recap. You guys are just absolutely amazing. I've learned so much from both of you. Uh, you know, dear friends, enjoy hanging out with you guys. You guys just, you know, iron sharpens, uh, you know, iron. You guys just make everybody around you so much uh, smarter, more efficient. Greatly appreciate what you guys bring to the table. Max, you know, CEO of Future State Engineering. We're for working folks, obviously, here on LinkedIn. If somebody's catching this on YouTube or another platform, where can folks connect and find you? Yeah, so LinkedIn, I'm on posting all the time, three times a week. Um, our website, futurestateengineering.com. My YouTube channel, so I have a YouTube channel that has all my videos. So there's tons of information about learning and about mindset. So I got a whole series on mindset change. So those are probably the three places you can find me most. Awesome. And also, and boy, guys, if you ever get a chance to, to attend one of Max's workshops or webinars, it is, man, it is worth every penny. It is gold. I'm telling you, I did it years and years ago, and I still use it on a daily basis. Dave, my friend, where's the best place for folks to connect with you? Absolutely. So if you guys are watching on LinkedIn, absolutely, please connect uh, with me on LinkedIn. I spend what most people would say is way too much time on LinkedIn, uh, posting, uh, talking <laughs> with people about, about all of this stuff and more. Um, if you guys aren't on LinkedIn, you guys can check out my website, Kaplan, C-A-P-E-L-I-N dot I-O. That will link you to my website. And I've got some blog posts and I've got some videos and I've got like hundreds of them that need to uh, get repopulated up there. Uh, I briefly mentioned profit by design that will get uh, get rolling uh, up on the up on the website soon at some point, either this week or next week, whenever I find time to 20 minutes to, to focus on that. Uh, <laughs> beyond that, I will make the plug to Manufacturing Hub. So every Wednesday at about four o'clock East Coast time, I go live with my counterpart Vlad yep. um, on LinkedIn. Um, you guys can also find us on the Solus PLC YouTube channel or manufacturinghub.live. We talk about all things manufacturing. Every month we pick a theme. 
Uh, and we put four conversations around that with four different experts, except this month we don't have a theme. We're just kind of uh, putting together a bunch of conversations that we are happy to have. But uh, check us out. Uh, we Again, every Wednesday at about 4 o'clock, uh, we go live. Well, we try to do it for an hour, but we can never do it within an hour. I don't know how you guys keep it within an hour. We're always like 90 minutes in, and I'm pulling the shepherd's hook saying, sorry, Vlad, yeah. but we got to leave. Like yeah. some people have things that they have to do yeah. with uh, w- with their life. But but please feel free to uh, to connect with me. Um, in, in any of those places, come hang out and ask questions. Oh my God. I've, I can't like this, this, like yeah. I just blinked and like an hour just went by this. Yeah, thing. exactly. And, and, and if anybody catching this on replay, we're going to have all in the show notes. We yeah. have, we'll have links to future state engineering. Mm-hmm. We'll have uh, links to Kaplan uh, manufacturing hub podcast. You absolutely want, boy, if you think Dave is a riot here, you want to catch him on his podcast and on his LinkedIn live. And so guys, we'll wind down. I just, I, I cannot thank the two of you enough. I knew this was going to be good. I, we've got to have you guys back on because yeah, like we, we need absolutely. like part two, we need yep. part three, part we two. Need part yep. four. So we need to keep this going. But guys, if you have, you know, what I'd love to do next, you know, uh, boy, you ever have a, um, we're talking about case studies and what have you, you have a client that you want to uh, bring on, you know, create like a little panel. Let's yep. actually do that. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Max, you and I will talk about that uh, as we continue. So any parting thoughts, words of wisdom, Max Krug, any parting thoughts, words of wisdom for everybody out there? Yeah. So it's, I was just thinking, it's like, if there's any companies out there that are looking for help, it's like, it'd be great if you call us before the ship starts sinking. <laughs> yeah. 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 I usually get the call when the ship's sinking. It's like, we're in yeah. trouble. That's it, that's why I'm always I picking know. Max's brain before I, before I'm, I'm like, Max, what about this? What about this? What about this? <laughs> Dave, any words of wisdom before we wind down? Uh, I, I love that, Max. Yes. Uh, so any any slightly buoyant ships, please uh, please give us a ring. Uh, but beyond that, I would say that we talked about a huge number of topics, but but everything is is one step at a time. We, we briefly chatted yeah. about focus, right? Like think about where you are as an organization. Think about where you want or need to be, and then go plot out what those steps look like. And it may seem like a, a huge path to get. But if you take it one step at a time, there is a much higher probability of success than just trying to uh, to jump to the future state. Gosh. Yeah, focus. It's like do what should be done and don't do what shouldn't be done. That's the hard part. Right. It makes it sound so easy, doesn't he, Kurt? It makes it sound it simple, it but it's not easy. So, guys, thank you both so much. Appreciate you. Appreciate what you do for manufacturing. Appreciate your friendship. And boy, thank you for anybody out there, uh, Whitney, Diane, David, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, everybody. anybody out there listening, connect with Dave Griffith here, connect with Max Krug. Boy, you will certainly thank yourself. Your business will thank you. We're going to wind down. Damon, we're back at it on Friday. You've got yes, Faces of are. Business here at 6 o'clock Eastern, 3 o'clock Pacific on Tuesday and on Thursday. So yes. check out Damon. Just go to his profile. And we just wish everybody an amazing, incredible week. Thank you. God bless. And we'll talk to you soon. See you later. Thank you all.